Hello, in this video we are talking about resonance and damping, part of the standing waves and resonance unit. Mostly some knowledge stuff about the way you can make stuff wave for better or worse. Here we go. Okay, the idea here of resonance comes down to something called natural frequency or resonant frequency. So you might see both of these. Um, it's the idea that most stuff that can vibrate has a frequency that it likes to vibrate at. Think of our classic mass on a spring or a pendulum or two really simple um, examples. But those have a frequency that they like to vibrate at, like based on the amount of mass on the spring, for example, or the stiffness of the spring. And so we have some equations for those, but anything that can vibrate does have at least one natural frequency. Lots of objects really have multiple resonant frequencies, but it's a frequency that's something that can oscillate would like to oscillate with if it was just left to its own devices. So it's pretty easy to get something to vibrate at its natural frequency, hence it being natural. It's hard though to get it to vibrate at other frequencies. If you have a pendulum, uh, it's got a certain rate it wants to swing back and forth at. If you try to like, you know, jiggle it in a certain way and get it to swing faster or shorter without like changing the length of the string, it's really not gonna work. Um, so things really tend to wanna nat naturally vibrate at this resonant frequency and it's very hard to force them to vibrate at any other frequency. If you're trying to make something vibrate, you're doing it with your own kind of frequency of like an input, and so we call that a driving frequency. So really you need another oscillator trying to make the first oscillator oscillate at a frequency. Uh, so we call this the driving frequency. So if you're trying to make something vibrate, it's the frequency you're putting in to try to make that vibration happen. And if that driving frequency equals the natural frequency or equals the resonant frequency, you get what's called resonance. So you try to vibrate that pendulum at the exact same frequency it likes to vibrate at, um, well, it's gonna oscillate a whole lot back and forth. What happens is when there's resonance, you have the maximum amplitude in motion. A classic example of this is a pushing a kid on a swing. Um, you naturally know how to do this if somebody's on a swing and you're pushing them. Uh, you know, leave them to just swing back and forth. They swing back and forth at a certain rate because they're basically a pendulum. And you know if you want to push them and make them go higher, you have to push every time they get to like the top of their motion, right? You give them a push right there, they'll go a little higher. Then they come back and get to the top of their motion, you give them a push again go a little higher. So if you keep pushing at the same rate that they're swinging, they'll go higher and higher. All right, so that's resonance. Now imagine you were pushing at a different rate. Like you push them, and then they get halfway up to the other side, and you go run forward, and you push them again, and then they start falling back towards you, and you push them again, it's going to be chaos, right? You're not going to make them swing more. You're going to probably get knocked over. Everything's going to be all wacky. So that's the idea. The input would be the driving frequency. And if you drive at the resonant frequency, you get resonance. And maximum amplitude is the key idea there. This can be used in good ways, and this can come up in not so good ways. So you do want to know that resonance has useful and destructive effects. So a few examples. Resonance comes up a lot in musical instruments. Designing an instrument, you think a lot about um, resonance. Also, in, in general, uh, audio engineering, let's say, the, the engineering of a room. A room even has certain frequencies that the walls might vibrate if you hit a certain note and you try to reduce that. But like a guitar, for example, an acoustic guitar is made to resonate, especially like at low frequencies, which is what, what makes it kind of extra loud, um, and it can project with just by itself. So the like size of the opening in the middle of the guitar and the type of wood you use and how you shape the guitar and the different pieces that you put inside, all of that is made to help the guitar resonate where you want it to resonate and not resonate where you don't want it to resonate. Um, so that's one place is designing instruments. A 
destructive version is the example of somebody singing and breaking a wine glass. Um, well, here's one where we're using a speaker to do it in this here picture. But there is, you know, you like give a little ding to a glass. You can do the trick with these guys where you rub your finger along the top and it'll make a noise. Uh, whatever that frequency is, is the frequency it wants to vibrate at. And if you can provide that same frequency to the glass, you'll make it vibrate more and more and more and more and more. And eventually it vibrates so much that it shatters. Uh, very hard to do this with your voice, but there you go. Okay, some other examples. Um, there are resonance. There is resonance in some types of circuits. Uh, we don't get into these too much in the IB, but there is some electrical resonance. And essentially you can get an alternating current signal, an electrical signal. You can sort of amplify it with these resonance effects. So you can make a make an electrical sing signal stronger with some resonance by matching certain frequencies. And another place that comes up that we'll talk about in IB physics is the greenhouse effect is a classic example of resonance. The quick version is there are gases in the atmosphere called greenhouse gases, and they have a resonant frequency that matches the frequency of infrared light. Uh, so an infrared light, which uh, we can think of as heat, comes and hits some greenhouse gases, they'll absorb that and vibrate for a second. And then uh, it turns out they spit it back out. Some of it comes back to us. It gets a little warmer down here. And there's a whole thing of the greenhouse effect. But the greenhouse gases have a very important resonant frequency because it matches infrared, which is the type of energy coming off of the planet. Uh, it makes a big impact on our climate. And another classic example uh, somewhat debated. This is uh, sort of mostly due to resonance. It's a little more complicated when you really get down to it, but resonance is a good general way to think of this. Um, a very famous incident was the Tacoma Narrows Bridge in 1940. It was a bridge here in the States that collapsed because the bridge liked to vibrate at a certain frequency, and it turned out on windy days, the wind could push the bridge in just the right way at just the right rate. They could kind of drive it in just the right way to get it vibrating back and forth. And the wind would uh, essentially kind of make it vibrate more and more and more and more until the bridge collapsed. Um, if you have any interest in studying engineering, you will certainly learn about this incident. It's a very famous uh, example. And we learned a lot about structural design uh, from this incident. This is an example, uh, you can think of this as resonance. There's a frequency that that bridge wants to vibrate at. So really, when you're designing a bridge, it's best to try to design it in a way that it doesn't have a very strong resonant frequency because you don't want this to happen. You don't want the bridge to like very easily vibrate at a certain rate. So there's tricks of ways you can, uh, ways you can design this to reduce that. Okay, and the other thing that's um, sometimes related, but a little bit different, but there's one other thing you want to know in this general topic, and it's about damping. Damping we've talked about a little bit. So remember the idea of damping is that when you have something oscillating, uh, say the mass on the spring, the amplitude will tend to decrease over time in real life because of resistive forces like air resistance. Um, so that's the detail we kind of know already. The, what we'll add here is there are some specific types of damping. Light damping, heavy damping, and critical damping, which um, will You'll often see two called overdamped and underdamped instead of heavy and light. But here's a picture of sort of the idea. They're the overdamped and critical damped are a little stranger than what you're used to. What we're used to is underdamped motion, which is there on the right, which is something going up and down, getting smaller and smaller. But those other two, these are masses on springs. This is an example of damping, just a little bit more extreme damping. So we're going to kind of define these, but this picture sort of shows you the idea Overdamped, critically damped, underdamped. All right, so light damping is the one you're probably the most familiar with. And this is where something continues to do its oscillations just less and less in terms of its amplitude. So the simple pendulum, the spring mass oscillator, a thing, you know, going back and forth uh, with a smaller and smaller amplitude over time. 
classic example of light damping. The IV isn't going to really get into the math of any of this, so it is mostly a sort of knowledge thing. Um, one fun fact, though, is that for light damping, there is sort of some math behind the, uh, the rate here. If you, were to hit, if you were to plot the peaks, like the maximum amplitude of each cycle, and connect them, you get this fun kind of like gradually curving down type of thing. It's exponential decay is what it is. There's an equation that's like e to the negative something, something, something with the t in there for time. And so you do get um, this sort of decrease in amplitude over time. But you'll continue to oscillate. Like it keeps going back and forth, just less and less. If the damping is even stronger, though, you can have what's called critical damping or heavy damping, um, which is sometimes called critical damping or over damping. So this blue is showing the um, light damping that we're uh, kind of used to. So that's the first example that we just looked at. But you can have so much damping that the thing doesn't even really oscillate back and forth. You let the mass kind of fall, but it stops right at equilibrium. There's so much damping that it stops before it can even really do a full oscillation. And you can see the difference between heavy damping, which is this yellow line here, and critical damping, which is this kind of pinky line here is the rate at which that happens. So critical damping is damping where you are at some cutoff point. There's, this is kind of the math cutoff between light damping and heavy damping, or under damping and over damping. But what it does is it brings the system to its equilibrium point very quickly, um, the quickest possible approach to zero. So it's like it gets it to its equilibrium and stops any sort of vibration as quickly as possible. One example, and this might seem a little weird because it doesn't really oscillate, but that's kind of the point, is these little things that you see on the top of some doors, um, like in the school and such. These are a damping thing. They do damping. And what it is is it lets the door shut closed um, without going back and forth, like you're walking into a saloon when you walk into the classroom. That's not what you want. I mean, maybe it's what you want, but that's not how we design them. Uh, we design them so that it'll, you know, start flopping back to its closed position, but this will stop it from vibrating back and forth and let it close in generally as quick a time as you can kind of get away with. Um, sometimes these, these can be a little different. This might sometimes be an example of heavy damping, uh, but critical damping would mean that we're getting to zero very quickly, as quick as you really, quickly as you really can. You don't want that door to be closing for like a minute. Okay, so that's critical damping. And again, this, this picture here really shows you the whole idea. But critical damping means you stop the oscillation immediately, bring it to zero before it can go back and forth in the minimum possible time. Over damping then is the same idea. This thing's not going to oscillate. We stop it from oscillating, but you do it in a longer time. So it's not that cutoff. So this is called heavy damping or over damping, and it's very similar to critical, but it's a longer amount of time. Um, so that's the idea. It's going to take longer. One example is the shocks in your car are typically, we call them heavy damping. Sometimes you can think of them as critical, so there's, there's a little bit of overlap in these ideas. Um, but heavy damping in your shocks, the springs in your car, means if you hit a bump, if you hit a road a uh, bump or something, a speed bump, uh, your car is not going to like bounce up and down forever after you hit that uh, bump. That would not be ideal. That would make for a great ride. You want, as the car kind of, you know, vibrates a little bit, you want it to stop that vibration. And you don't really want it to stop super quickly because that could be a lot of force. If it was going to like very, very quickly stop you from oscillating, um, that could be too much force, and so often these are sort of a form of heavy damping where it's going to stop you from bouncing up and down um, for a long time and bring you back to your rest position in a smooth and kind of comfortable way. So that's the idea of heavy damping. And finally, there is some impact on frequency. This is something we ignore a lot and we can uh, assume away in a lot of our simple harmonic motion stuff. Um, because it's very small in most cases, but there is a little bit of an impact of damping on frequency. 
Um, so you just want to know generally these are the two rules. Damping, when damping happens, the frequency of a system will decrease slightly, and so will the amplitude. Um, amplitude, I think, makes sense. Uh, if there's damping, it's going to have less amplitude. But there is a little bit of change to the frequency too. So you can see here it's pretty small. Again, with like a mass on a spring, you're not really going to notice it. Um, but yeah, so if you have no damping, this might be what it looks like when we have light damping like for real. This natural frequency, this is showing us the, the natural frequency, um, is just, just, just a little lower. And then we have more damping, more, um, and so on. This is another graph you'll see a lot, uh, which is a graph of amplitude versus frequency, uh, driving frequency, that is. So this is the idea that if you try to make something vibrate back and forth, um, you'll get the biggest amplitude when your driving frequency is equal to the natural frequency. You get this big dramatic spike, spike here because otherwise there's not going to be very much smooth um, oscillation back and forth. But if you can match the natural frequency with your driving frequency, you get a really big amplitude. And so when there's a little bit of damping, that natural frequency is just a little bit smaller and the amplitude is lower. And that's about it. Uh, damping and resonance. There you have it. Some more knowledge for you about oscillations and how they work. Uh, it is mostly knowledge stuff. Again, not much math here. So uh, some fun facts for you to know as we continue our waves adventures. All right. See ya.